but you're on mute. Oh, <laughs> all right. Thanks for that. <laughs> I'll repeat what I just said because no one heard it. <laughs> all right. So welcome everybody. Um, this is the uh, the 2022 Rise Lunch and Learn series webinar number three. Uh, we're gonna listen to um, Wafa McKay and Dr. Jordana Islam, who will talk about food security through traditional teachings. Uh, before we begin, I just want to do some introductions. Uh, my name is Chantal Henderson. I am the Indigenous Programs Outreach Coordinator for the First Nations Waste Minimization Program here at the Green Action Center. And I uh, am Ojibwe. I am from Penemutang First Nation and Seikin First Nation, and I am Sacred Tree Woman. So welcome. Um, I would like to uh, invite my co-host to introduce herself as well. Uh, thanks, Chantel. Um, I, uh, I'm pleased to be here to help uh, Chantel out with this uh, lovely webinar series that she's organized. Uh, my name is Amy Smith, and I am also part of the First Nations waste minimization team, and I am one of three community pathfinders. Uh, we, we work with communities on landfill, recycling, waste diversion activities, and I am a settler living in uh, Indigenous territory in uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba. <clears throat> so a bit of our uh, agenda. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. All right. Great. So uh, here's our agenda for webinar three. Um, um, we just did our welcome and introductions. Uh, I'm going to do a land acknowledgement, uh, and then we'll talk about all the other necessary things before we begin. And uh, we'll introduce our speakers and let them do their presentation. And then we'll have a 10 minute Q&A afterwards. Uh, so, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, comments, put them in uh, the chat box, and then we'll do cl closing remarks and our upcoming webinars. So, I uh, will start with the land acknowledgement. So, the Green Action Center is located on the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabeg, Ninu, Anishinawag, Dakota, and Dene peoples. It is also the home homeland of the Métis Nation. We acknowledge that our water is sourced from Shoal Lake 40, First Nation, and the hydroelectricity we use comes from numerous First Nation territories around Manitoba. Um, and just a couple of notes about uh, the chat function and Zoom functions before we get started. I'm sure most uh, folks are familiar, but just as a reminder, um, Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat uh, column and let us know your name and where you're watching from. You can also ask any questions for the speaker in the chat as well. So you'll find the chat feature along the bottom of your screen. If you move your mouse down there, you can uh, left click to open up the chat. And then um, when you've opened up the chat, make sure you pick um, either all panelists and or attendees or some people zoom will say everyone so make sure you're sending the message out to uh, everyone in the webinar and there you can enter your comment or question and hit send to uh, let us all see it all right <laughs> All right, <laughs> and on to our uh, introduction of Wakpa McKay from uh, Sioux Valley, Dakota Nation. Um, Wakpa Iwega, hopefully I didn't uh, mess that up too much, McKay, uh, translated from Dakota to English means river crossing. He is the climate change research assistant for the Wipazokpa Wakpa Climate Change and Environment Program in Sioux Valley, Dakota Nation. He began working in his community as the summer student coordinator, which involved him facilitating and organizing a kayaking slash camping trip 
in the summer of 2021, where seven summer students participated in a three-day camping trip down the Assiniboine River. This trip gave him the chance to perceive all of nature's beautiful creatures, which ignited his passion for protecting the environment, animals, and plants as a whole. Not long after, he was hired as the climate change research assistant. Whenever he gets the chance, he enjoys advocating for the environment through community engagement sessions and presentations. Through his work, he has the opportunity to proudly share his experiences about empowering and sustaining the environment. For instance, this past summer, he volunteered at Sioux Valley's community gardens to help mound and water the vegetables which were later harvested and distributed to the Elders Elementary School and the Community Health Fair. Growing up, he always saw himself studying the law as a future career, but now he desire, all he desires is to keep the planet's ecosystem and environment healthy and self-sustaining. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today, Wakba, and it sounds like you'll have a lot of very interesting information to share based on your bio. Uh, we also have our second speaker who will uh, be uh, speaking during the presentation as well, uh, Dr. Durdana Islam. She is the program manager for Manitoba's Climate Action Team. Durdana's heart is in creating a healthier and sustainable community. As a climate change researcher and a mother of two kids, she is worried about our future generations. Dr. Islam believes that it is through our determination and shared vision we can accomplish real change to build a better world. She envisions a Manitoba where real action on climate change supports thousands of new jobs and saves Manitobans millions of dollars as we transform to a more efficient and green economy. So take it away. All righty, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope your guys' lunch is uh, nice and filling, but I'm just gonna share my screen right now. Um, you guys can see the presentation slide now then, hey? Okay, awesome. Yep. All right, I'm just gonna move my mouse over here so I can see. All right, awesome. Yeah, yeah. so then welcome to uh, Sioux Valley's Rise, the uh, Sioux Valley Dakota Nation and the um, Manitoba Climate Action Team Rise Lunch and Learn Series. Uh, we're gonna be presenting today for this lunch period. Um, and uh, our title for the presentation is called Wipizoka Wakwa Climate Change and Environment. That's our program's name but we added the food security through traditional teachings. And I, and I wanna speak upon that uh, real quick um, about the food security through traditional teachings. Um, we kind of tie this in with our traditional teachings with the community gardens, for example, and I can speak more about it as the presentation goes on. But our program tries to bring back our traditional teachings that was kind of lost over time through intergenerational impacts. Um, and then we'd also like, and then we're, um, we, we also want to bring people together. And then, um, and we're a big, we're a big community. And then we, we, we gardened before, but, um, but the government, they decided that we had to stop guard, or excuse me, let me start all over. My, my brain is everywhere right now. <laughs> um, I have some notes down here too. I'm just reading off of, um, um, I'll share that. I, I guess I can share this next slide, but um, I'll just move on to the next slide. Yeah, I'll just get on to this actually. <laughs> get to know our team. Okay. Uh, our team, um, me and Cheyenne, Cheyenne Ironman is my supervisor. She's the climate change and special projects coordinator for the climate, Wipazokawapa Climate Change and Environment Program. And I'm her research assistant. Um, and then to our to Cheyenne's right on the on the screen there you could see Dr. Durdana Islam. She's the climate change action team project manager uh, based out of Winnipeg, Manitoba. Um, and then we're going to be working together in the future to develop to deliver workshops in the community that help battle climate change and that kind of like you know to move towards a, a healthier a healthier future and then we now we'll talk about like some of the workshops that we kind of want to do in the future like uh for instance there's one where we want to do bike repair so then we can bring down the um the um the emissions and the uh you know all of the gas the the um carbon emissions in the air in the community and you know just to get that healthy active living up and going again um 
Next slide. So then we have this group called the Climate Change Working Group. And uh, the working group, we meet about once or twice a month just to discuss kind of like what our projects are within the month in the upcoming months. So for example, we're planning a winter culture camp at the end of the month. And we plan on, you know, bringing the whole community together, bringing all the departments together to organize this event for the community members to, you know, just have fun. Um, we want to bring some snowshoes in the community. We kind of want to have some, you know, hatchet throwing contests, some 3D archery out here and horseshoe toss, kind of like bringing back some of those fun games to the community because COVID hit our community hard. And we want to have that. We want to, you know, just try to have fun again. Um, but as you can see, we have Eugene Ross to the left. He's a knowledge keeper. Um, and then with our group, we have people from, you know, youth up to up to elders. So then it's very diverse. We have Eugene Ross. He's a knowledge keeper. Nancy Hoppe, she's an elder and a fluent language speaker. James Pratt, he works at the school out here over in uh, Brandon. So he helps out with all of that. And he helps deliver some of our information packages and handouts and gives them to the students. And they're interested in, 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 uh, in kind of like what we do. And uh, we want to involve them more in the future. Um, and then we also have Carol Johnson. She's a trained environmental uh, monitor. Uh, she's also, also a governance representative for us. Um, she's such she's so good at her job here. Um, and then we have Ava McKay. She's a trained environmental monitor and a youth representative. Uh, we have Justin Paco. And then these three at the bottom, they're recent, they're new. Uh, they're new on the on the on our on our committee here, on our working group. Uh, we have Justin Paco, he's a, a mental health community health representative. And we have Thurman Darby Essie. Um, he kind of helps with all of our food initiatives. And then he he's he's been around with the food industry lots. Like he he helped with um some um what it, what are they called <laughs> sorry some food trucks and stuff like that so whenever we need to talk about food and stuff he's the man to go to and that we have another youth representative um on Tana McKay and we want to try to get the youth the elders and you know the adults involved so we can have everyone in the community involved not just you know we're not focused on just youth or just elders we want to help the whole community um as a group and just in case if you guys don't know where Sioux Valley Dakota Nation is as you can see on the left here, it's, we're based in Manitoba, but we're right in between, I'd say, Regina and Winnipeg. We're about 20 minutes outside of Brandon, Manitoba, um, 20 to 30 minutes. And then on the right side of the screen, you can see how large our reserve is. Uh, the yellow border here is actually where our reserve ends. Um, and as I understand it, our border was actually, it ran, it run straight down to the number one and it cut across. So it was a big rectangle at one point. Um, but that's from what I've been hearing in the community. But that's kind of like just where we're located in Canada. But about us, <clears throat> about us. So then our program where we have a bunch of different initiatives and a different, you know, um, kind of like um, kind of workshops we want to deliver to the community. So then some of these involve planning for climate change. Uh, to speak upon that climate change adaptation and planning research. So then that's kind of part of what my job is. I have to do more research elements. Um, and this involves kind of like creating a Dakota dictionary, which is what we're working on right now. And this Dakota dictionary will in include all of the Dakota words that involve the environment, the climate, um, you know, just stuff surrounding that. So then we could have it for the program whenever we need to refer to something in Dakota when we're at workshops, or you know, if we're at training events and stuff like that, then we can always look back to the dictionary. And um, ideally, I'd like to see us deliver these dictionaries out to the community as well. Um, so, and then underneath uh, the plan for climate change, we are also conducting 30 interviews uh, to community members out here. We're just asking, you know, kind of like, what kind of what kind what kind of changes they've seen in our community surrounding climate change, um, and what kind of stories they heard from uh, from Ahana from a long time ago from their elders and so forth, and kind of just hearing what what community members uh, are experiencing on a personal and intimate level. So then these you know these interviews can last from twenty to forty minutes to even an hour, depending how how much they want to share. So this is a great opportunity for us to extract more information that way. And it's pretty unique. We can also share, share the interviews online and stuff like that if they wish. Um, so then this is, an, uh, this is an awesome opportunity for us to uh, get the word out there and to hear what the community members have to say about climate change. 
We're also doing a flood mapping workshop next week in Brandon, which is awesome. Um, but the thing is, it's kind of hard to deliver these workshops because, um, because Sioux Valley's or Sioux Valley's terrain is so unique and different. Like where we have hills on this side of Sioux Valley, we have floodplains on this side. So it's kind of like almost a big slope or bowl almost. Uh, we've recently had some flooding incidents as well in the past, uh, which also affected Winnipeg and Brandon, if I believe. Um, so yeah, with having such a different terrain and a different, you know, the 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 um, just the terrain, it makes it difficult for us to deliver these specific workshops because there's so many things we have to worry about. We're also not on good land. We're not on solid soil. I we have like clay areas in the ground as well and there's some water underneath um underneath the ground as well so we got to take that into consideration when we're building stuff so it's very hard for us to deliver workshops like this but um we want to we want to deliver them so we can educate the community and you know empower our people moving forward and hopefully spark some you know some kind of some kind of drive for the younger people to pursue this kind of uh, this kind of education in their future and this job. Uh, we're also doing a waste, a solid waste management in our community. So then this is going to include um, it's basically a farmer's market, like a monthly farmer's market, but we call it a Watani sale. And then, you know, this is when community members could bring their old clothes or their, you know, they could bring baked goods or whatever, right? Just for community members to come and gather and congregate and just to visit and to support one another. Um, we also have some recycling bins out here. We have five blue bins, which is there. And every time I look over there, they're like always full. So then our community is recycling and people are, are wanting more bins and they've been asking us. So, you know, we're busy over here and it's, it's awesome to see our community just working together to kind of just, just, you know, to work together to recycle, I guess. It's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> I like it. Um, we're also gonna look into uh, doing a battery exchange program. So then community members can bring old batteries and then they can exchange them for newer ones. Um, we're also, we also did an, uh, an environmental monitoring training back in last summer. I wasn't a part of it. I wish I was, but it was a five day training course at our new community center here. Uh, they spent four days in the, in the, uh, in the class learning about, you know, uh, watersheds and kind of like how to do the different water sampling methods that they've later practiced on the fifth day. Um, but I guess, yeah, uh, that, that's a, just a planning for climate change. But if you move over to the right capacity building, employment training workshops and land-based programs. So then for example, yeah, the environmental monitor training, that was uh, a training opportunity that we gave to community members um, just, to, just to empower them, like I was saying. Um, I'd like to move over to the food security, how to feed our community as climate change worsens. Uh, like I said, we have community gardens over here. We have two plots. We have uh, a smaller one over by the center of uh, of the of the of the reserve. And we have a large, a much larger one over by our power ground areas. Um, so this, the community gardens allows us to give food back to the community, to give it to the elders and to you know the youth, so that they could that they could eat healthy food, you know, not processed or, you know, it's not McDonald's or KFC or Burger King or what have you. Um, it's just giving that food security back to them, just uh, empower, like, you know, just giving them that food is with, which is what we're working towards, our food sovereignty plan. Um, we're also hoping to get some bees this year. Uh, I'd like to be a beekeeper. I, we're in contact with someone to get some bees. We first we want to start off with two hives, but uh, that's just our our upcoming uh, upcoming next couple of, couple of months. Our plans. Um, so then uh, we're gonna roll that out uh, pretty soon. So. Um, uh, yeah, and then we also have uh, raised garden beds in the community. We have over 200 raised garden beds for each household. Um, but the thing is that community community members, they don't really fully understand how to like, like me, for example, I don't know how to garden. I, I don't know where, where I'd begin, you know. So then we developed a harvesting and planting guide for our community, which involves, you know, the, the plants that we would plant here. 
um, and when to plant them, kind of like a timeline. This is a good time to plant and this is a good time to harvest. So then just giving, just giving that education to our people, um, you know, just building upon that. And a renewable energy, number four. So increasing efficiency, investing in renewables and energy audit and feasibility study of Elders Lodge. So we have a Dakota Oyate Elders Lodge here, which all of our, which most of our seniors are currently stay and reside at. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but yeah, with the Elders Lodge, uh, apparently, I guess we've been doing some, the feasibility study and the energy audit, and I guess we're pretty close to becoming a net zero building, Manitoba's first net zero uh, facility. So that's going to be awesome. Uh, we're trying to work towards that. And by, and by working towards that, I, what I mean is that we've, we've got some funding to hire a, a, per, a, a energy advocate um, position for two years, which they will get all of the training that they need and all the education. Um, and then they're going to look into like, you know, how we could upgrade the homes, like uh, switch out the LED light, like uh, switch out the light bulbs to make them to LEDs or switch, you know, batteries to reusable, uh, rechargeable batteries or stuff like um, even with the shower, shower heads, we could even switch those out to uh, produce less uh, um to save on energy, you know? Um, so then that's kind of like what that position is gonna be uh, kind of gonna be for. Then there's a little timeline at the bottom of the page, May, uh, May la of last year, that's when our program started. And then that was when Cheyenne Ironman, my supervisor was hired. And then July, 2021, summer of last year, the uh, climate change working group started. So then that's when we got all of our guys together to start planning, okay, our, what's, you know, our, our mission and our, our um, kind of like just helping us work together with our objectives and tasks. And then of summer 2021, we also had a kayak and a canoe program, which you guys heard about, and I'll share more about it um, in the upcoming slides. We also developed, like I said, two community gardens of the summer 2020, uh, 2021. <clears throat> and then the winter of 2021, we, we hosted some canning classes and willow basket weaving classes, which I'll speak more about in the upcoming slides. But what is climate change? Climate change is the climate. Well, what is climate, I guess, to start off? Climate is the average weather conditions and temperatures in an area over time. So then the climate change is linked to a higher levels of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases released into the atmosphere. So, you know, greenhouses are good to have because you can plant all year round, but they do release greenhouse gases, which is bad for the for the for the for the climate, because that increases the our climate's temperature, which you know, um, the higher atmospheric temperature speeds up the Earth's water cycle as well, and then this affects all of the moisture and precipitation in the air, which in turn affects you know the snow the snow intake the raining the the rain intake that we have and also the humidity in the air. So then that could cause future droughts or you know, future floods. Um, <clears throat> and then weather is created by uh, different factors. Like I said, the air temperature and the moisture and the humidity and the atmospheric, atmir, atmospheric pressure, <laughs> excuse me, uh, which all contribute to cloud formation and rainfall and uh, snowfall, droughts, humidity, like I said. But uh, over time, the changes in weather patterns alter the ecosystem, which, which is everything to us, right? It's the plants, the, the organisms in the ground, the wildlife, everything, the food, um, everything is connected. So then we just, like, for example, like, um, if we do see a drought this year, which we might see a drought, I'm not too sure. If we do see a drought, this will affect the farmers, then, which affects the, the, I guess the um, the groceries at the stores, and then which will affect our prices for those groceries, as you guys probably already know. Um, but how is climate change impacting Sioux Valley? So then I got some quotes here from um, from a youth, a community member, and an elder, and they shared um, that because of this previous summer's drought, uh, their family's water, their water well, um, suffered a large decrease in its water level. Um, most of our, our, most of our homes are run off of water wells and holding tanks and a water pumping uh, treatment system here. So then this is, this is one youth, but keep in mind, we have a hundred houses on the, our reserve. So then this cannot only be happening to one house. This is very common in our, in our community. So then 
droughts are becoming much more more dangerous to us because well when the drought dries up the well water it makes the water in the in like you know if you turn on the shower or something it's going to smell kind of rotten or even gross or even moldy at first not until you have to run it for a minute or two which you are wasting about five to ten gallons of water per minute so that's not ideal at all um, and a community member sh shared how not enough snow and or rain plus the heat made grass fires worse this year you know if you if you smoke and then if you drop a cigarette butt well there you go you probably have a grass fire right there um they mentioned how the grass fire took out the wild plums in saskatoon and choke cherry bushes and hazelnuts in the field by their house and these are all traditional these are all traditional foods and um, um berries and nuts to us so then we're losing all of our traditional values our, our all of our traditional foods through these through these grass fires um but without the roots there, the riverbanks will be lost and then which can lead to erosion. Um, oh, these are along the, the our, um, our riverbanks. I mean, sorry, uh, this is kind of a different point. <laughs> um, but an elder shared, <clears throat> excuse me, and an elder shared in the last 10 years, the storms have been more unpredictable. So we see the weather quickly changing course and winds changing right as the, uh, right, right as the storm approaches. Uh, and it worries the elders, uh, and then they usually call one another and they begin smudging the, our homes for protection. Um, so, you know, it affects all of us, not only the youth, not only the elders, but, you know, the, uh, the, the adults as well. Um, uh, could you guys maybe just uh, let me know how much more time I have? I don't want to be, you know, taking up all of the time. <laughs> I don't know how fast or slow I'm going. Um, but this slide's about uh, the food and health and how everything kind of like just ties together through safety, wildlife, and the seasons. Um, so then the, the changes in the soil and the weather, this impacts the ability to grow food. And then this, like I said, drives food prices to be increased. But in 2020, um, on the news the other, the other week, they said a family of four could be spending up to $1,000 or more on groceries, let alone and this is not only caused by climate change, but this is also caused by, you know, social, social travesty, uh, social dilemmas, you know, uh, with our protesting that happened over, um, over in the capital over there and with, you know, Russia um, going, attacking Ukraine, which is very, very sad to see. But um, yeah, that fact is just that number is probably increased probably $200, I wouldn't doubt. Uh, vegetable prices will likely increase, be increased by 5% and 7%. Another 10 minutes. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, the, wildlife changes, uh, the wildlife changes to the environment and the, the, avail the availability of food also impacts the health and survival of wildlife. Like I said, if we do not have berries or if we don't have, you know, our hazelnuts in the ground, well, where's, what's our deer going to eat? You know, we also hunt deer too, but we have to keep in mind if we over hunt, then we may cause an extinct an extinction an extinction with that with that wildlife. So it's kind of a balancing act right there as well. Um, so then you know the changes of soil and the grass fires and everything it impacts everything. Like I said, everything is tied together. Uh, and then wildlife uh, they're not used to seeing um, they're not used to seeing enroaching. So like for example, bears are we've seen some bears coming into the community. We actually had one just across the street from here, <laughs> chilling up in a tree. It was a baby bear, but we got him out of there. Uh, we uh, some community members mentioned they've seen some cougars and some moose. Um, and we also had an abundance of rabbits in our community, but recently we've we've haven't seen much lately here uh, we joke around that they all moved to Brandon <laughs> but I know that's and that's not true it could be true but you know they're just uh, being enroached which is very sad to see in our community we're losing all of that which is not good for anyone um, seasons the timing of the seasons and the climate indicators so signs in nature what we use to predict uh, what seasons will will be like is not as reliable. So our elders, they would say that they we could predict, you know, the upcoming season and how the you know how the weather is going to be like tomorrow if the sun is nice and then you know stuff like that or if it's a full moon and you know they can say well it's going to be a nice day tomorrow. Um, but this year it's kind of hard to even determine that with the climate. Just you know, just the climate indicators, like I said. It's so unpredictable. 
Uh, for example, this year, the time to pick Saskatoons and wild turnips were earlier and um, they didn't last too long, the time span to, to pick those. I don't know if other communities see this as well. It'd be nice to know if uh, others do. Um, <clears throat> oh, sorry, I can't see my screen. Oh, there we go, okay. Our safety, uh, our safety, yes, like I said, it's unpredictable and dangerous weather. Uh, we've seen a couple of tornadoes in our community and like I said, some flash floods as well. Um, but BC records, uh, BC's record heat waves caused a 70% increase of sudden deaths. This was back in 2020, uh, 2021, last year, actually. Um, so are we, are we ready to prepare for, you know, those extreme heat waves and tornadoes and floods? Um, just another fact about that with the BC uh, record of heat waves, uh, a total of 595 people, nine, 595 people died in BC which were caused by the heat waves. So that's very disturbing to hear. Um, so yeah, I'd like to move on to like what our community is kind of doing surrounding uh, food sovereignty and food security. So we have this, like I said, the two community gardens that this started up in 2019, but because of COVID-19 and you know all of the craziness that was happening then, the, they didn't uh, plant a garden in 2020, but we picked it up again this year, like I said, back in May. Um, oh, uh, let me just uh, move back. Can I, how do I go back? Oh, there it is, nice. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, anyways, like I was saying, we picked up gardening again this past summer um, and vegetables, they were donated, uh, well, with the community gardens, I should just share that. We have two of them. We have a smaller plot in the photos, you could see the actual, that's the smaller plot there. But we have another plot, which is like, four times that size so it's quite large I haven't been to it me personally because I started this position last summer and the gardeners were just ending hay so then I couldn't really see it I didn't have time to do that but um but yeah I, I could have shared photos I'll do that next presentation though for sure but you could see in our photos yet yeah, we got some I believe those are radishes up there in the top right uh, you can see one of the community gardeners watering all of our little potato plants there. <laughs> and we, um, we donated these, our, all of our plants and our vegetables to, um, you know, we donated to uh, elders meetings in the community. We also donated, it, donated them to community health fairs, as well as um, the youth overnight camping and kayaking trip. Oh, excuse me. Uh, and then we also donated them to community engagement sessions and the uh, back to school uh, Wachipi uh, Carnival. Yeah, so then, like I said, we just want to be able to have that food security, that food sec to give food security back to our community, because we want to make sure our community members are fed the right nutritious food, so then, you know, we could be as healthy as ever, because Ahana back then, we, you know, we didn't eat KFC, or we didn't eat McDonald's and stuff like that. We used to eat plants, and we used to eat good, healthy nutritious food and, uh, you know, strong deer and, you know, bison. But now, you know, you see most indigenous people are, are diagnosed with diabetes or even worse type two diabetes. So we kind of want to work, work our way back to that, going back to the, the healthy food, um, kind of like the food, I guess you would say, kind of like what we ate back in the day. Uh, I wouldn't, I, I, uh, I wouldn't know how to word that, but facts i'd like to share some facts yeah if you're playing in the garden soil it releases serotonin which makes you feel happy um and this this could relate to grounding or earthing and for those who don't know about grounding and earthing that's when you walk on and it, it's proven a fact a scientific fact if you walk on the ground or the earth barefooted in the grass um you're gonna be you're gonna get you're gonna excuse me it, it allows you to receive and transfer negative electrons into your body because we're, I believe we're, we're, we're filled with positive electrons. So then they balance out, hey? Um, and then this also affects your cortisol levels, which, in, which is in your brain. And then, you know, like I said, it makes you feel happy, makes you feel good. Um, so, you know, try it out this summer, go play in some dirt and soil. I know I did last summer, <laughs> mounting up those potatoes. Um, uh, do your community gardeners, I'll answer the, some of these questions afterwards, but um, how, how much more time do I have left uh, before 
you know, um, I don't want to take up too much five, time. Five more minutes. Five more minutes. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, and a fun fact as well, uh, talking to your plants helps them grow. So uh, this was a proven fact, a vibration study. Uh, you know, when you have vibrate, like um, like there's a study, how did, how did it go? They did a study where they had um, speakers playing in, in a greenhouse. They had two greenhouses. They had one greenhouse with no speakers, no music. They had one with um, speakers um, filled with them and blasting music. And out of the two greenhouses, the one with speakers, had a much more vi vibrant plant growth. They had a, a more promising growth there. So then um, studies say that vibration is the key element to affect the plant growth, which is cool. I didn't know that. <laughs> I'll be singing to the, uh, the vegetables this summer for sure. <laughs> we also hired uh, five staff this year, which is awesome. We wanna empower our people as much as we can, give them those job opportunities. And you can see here our community gardens timeline. So July 12th up in the top left corner is kind of like, you know, it looks kind of shaggy. It looks like me without, a, you know, without a haircut in a while. So then we have to take out all the weeds and all of the unnecessary um, um, non-vegetables in there. And then uh, on July 15th, you could see we started watering and they were per they're coming out. Uh, gar garden was looking a bit more cleaned up. By July 20th, they were really coming in. We had a couple of rainfalls, which was promising. And then by July 23rd, you could see they were just blooming and blossoming. Like, look at that. That's awesome. Uh, we also hired one summer student and we've received 13 volunteers who came by to help out with that. And the kayaking and camping trip. I'll run through this real quick. We had a kayaking and camping trip last summer. Um, our program, we took seven summer students on a three-day kayaking and camping trip down the Assiniboine River, which is connected to Sioux Valley here. We started from the Verdon, the south of the Verdon Valley and ending to the um, south end of Sioux Valley. And we camped over two nights, which was a three-day um, three kayaking trip in total. And we cooked meals over a fire and picking medicines along the way and learning about the environment and wildlife. Like we've seen some owl, we've seen a couple owls, we seen some birds and then we started, you know, whistling along the way. So it was pretty fun. A couple of the uh, summer students said that they'd never done anything like this before and they really thanked us for it. So we plan on making this an annual trip as well. But we, we got to make sure we work on, you know, our team development as well. So then, you know, they help one another and they look after each other because it's a dangerous kayaking. You know, what if somebody tips or something? Well, we all got to stop and hurdle up and help that one person. So it's a great opportunity for the students and for the youth to come together and just, you know, strengthen their relationships. So on day one, it took us four hours. Day two, it, take, it took us eight hours on the water to get to the next campsite. And the third day wasn't as hard. Here's the, uh, here's the map you can see. Starting point, we started uh, uh, north of the Verdon Valley. Um, and the red, that was our day one, four hour trip. And then the day two trip, that was ridiculous. <laughs> I'm surprised we made that. That was eight hours right there, that yellow band, um, which was insane. But uh, we got to, you know, next year we'll plan. We'll try to make it shorter, maybe make it into four days. And then in our, in our, um, our last final day, it was in the white. It wasn't too far. It was like five hours. So you can see Sioux Valley, Griswold, Oak Lake. But just as a reference, Here's Sioux Valley, and here is Verdon, Verdon. I believe Verdon is right here, this little town here. So that's roughly, I believe, 40, 40 minutes away from here. So we did, we did kayak uh, quite the distance uh, that time. And then these are some kayaking trip pictures from, uh, from, the, uh, from the summer. And this is me and Cheyenne. We were preparing our, our docking station. And this was our second day, uh, day two campsite. Then we were also preparing supper over here. Uh, fun fact, none of the guys wanted to learn how to uh, fillet the fish or prepare the fish. So, and it was all the girls. So, um, so we got to thank them for that, for, for feeding us. Um, and then we you know, cooked our battered fish over a fire. Uh, and then this was us picking some medicines along the way. Some of the summer students, we also had a fire in stories. Um, um, who was it? Roland, our, one of our community members, Roland Ironman. He came and looked after us over the night, just in case, you know, a cougar tried to come and attack us. He'll, he'll, uh, he'll get it for us. He'll attack it. So he shared some of his uh, hunting stories in our group photo. And uh, we had a lunch break, uh, as you can see in the bottom right corner. 
And then our jam, our canning classes, jam and salsa. This was a two-day class on how to make uh, how to make jam and salsa. Um, you know, this is how to can vegetables properly and safely because um, I didn't know how to can. So then this was a very uh, unique opportunity for me to just learn how to how to do this basic skill, which I could teach to my kids and my grandchildren, which is, you know, um, such, such a valuable thing to us, to our people. But our first class, we learned how to make jam. And our second class, we learned how to, uh, can, to make salsa and canned vegetables. Um, DOCFS, Dakota, or uh, Dakota Ojibwe Child Family Services, they purchased and made uh, home kits for those who couldn't attend the in-person classes because you have to be double vaxxed, of course. Um, and we try to be as safe as we can, you know, when it comes to COVID regulations. And then the virtual class watched from home and they followed along uh, kind of like a cooking show program. <laughs> uh, nobody was pulling a chef Gordon though, no swears. So that was good. <laughs> and in our Facebook, we had over uh, 50 views and uh, we had 30 people all together in person and, uh, and from home, watching from home. But the thing is, why, why preserve food? Why learn how to can? Uh, th this is important. I'm gonna run through these real quick. I know I'm running out of time. Um, you know what is you know what yeah, you know what is in your preserved foods. So, for example, the the can the vegetables. You know exactly what's in it. It's clean. It's coming from you. You're doing it yourself. It's not coming from the store or wherever else it may come from. You know, salsa making as well. You know what's going in it. You know, there's no crazy, um, I don't know, uh, no crazy additives or anything like that. Uh, same with pickling. Um, uh, and then this is also so you can bond and pass on the knowledge of preserving foods with family and friends. Uh, this is what I was speaking about. I want to do this with my kids and my family in the future, uh, just to pass on that knowledge. That's the key word there. Uh, and then, you know, to make most to make most of the seasonal flavors, uh, flavors and fresh. Uh, so then homegrown carrots always taste the best right out of the ground. I'm sure most of you know that for you, for those who garden. Um, and then this also expands, extends this, the food's shelf life, um, you know, because when they take, when they're, when they're shipping food, say from Mexico or something, they pick it when it's not, when it's, you know, it's not right, but it's almost getting there. So by time when they ship it from Mexico to here, how long is that window? How long is that shelf life? Hey, so then, you know, when you preserve a food, you know, it's fresh, it's, it's still good for a while. So it, it preserves that. Uh, and it's environmentally friendly because you can reuse the same cans as well, you know, just give them a good a wash, the jars. And then you can also reduce food packaging as well, as well as uh, food transportation, which involves, you know, carbon dioxide and the carbon footprint. So, you know, that it's always good to reuse your cans and stay at home. You don't have to go out and buy, you know, salsa. You can make it yourself. <laughs> uh, but during the, and this also, why preserve food? Because during the pandemic, you take fewer risks to, to, to the grocery store, uh, which reduce the risks, the risk of transmission. Uh, like I said, we had 30 participants and there's some photos there of our little canning class. Uh, and then this is, I'm almost done. This is the crafting, uh, crafting willow basket classes that I briefly talked about before. This is an awesome opportunity. We had six weeks of this uh, for over two months. We facilitated this workshop uh, with Eugene Ross. He's a well-known knowledge keeper, uh, an elder in our community. Um, and then uh, yeah, learning the history. Yeah, so then Eugene, he talked about, you know, the history of where it came from, why is why it's important to our people. And actually, our people, we used to sell them for like a dollar or two bucks back in the day. But, you know, back in the day, that was quite the penny. And it takes a while to make these things. Like, it took us six weeks to create our own little willow baskets. And they weren't even big, too. That The one he's holding in the photo, that's huge. I must have took them at least probably, well, they were good back in the day, probably a couple days the most, but, you know, because we lost that kind of that knowledge onto how to craft, um, we got to preserve that. So our program is trying to revitalize and bring those workshops back to the community. Uh, we also learned the different parts of the willow baskets, and uh, we made some little diagrams down there, just teaching people, you know, the values of it. You got to, you got to be patient with it. You got to take your time and you got to care for it. 
Uh, we also spent the afternoon harvesting the materials outside, which is great because community members, the ones who participated, they now know where to get everything and they know how to do it. It's easy. All they have to do is just pass on that knowledge next, which is, uh, which is key to our, to, to our community and just sharing that traditional knowledge. Um, so yeah, that was our crafting willow baskets. And uh, on my last slide here, upcoming plans. We Pazoka Walk about climate change and environment. We'll be working with Manitoba's climate action team. Durdana can talk more about this too as well when she comes, uh, when she speaks. Uh, they're gonna help deliver 10 workshops to our community. Uh, some of the ones that me and my, my supervisor, Cheyenne Ironman, we're talking about, you know, vermicomposting, that's, that involves earthworms, earthy worms. So, you know, I'm just a boy who likes playing in dirt, never mind <laughs> dirt and worms and everything like that. So I'm looking forward to the vermicomposting. It's basically earthworms, you know, just helping out the composting process. Um, uh, we're also looking to do a bike repair and maintenance workshop or uh, backyard composting. We also want to do face, uh, <laughs> sorry, a food waste reduction um, kind of workshop as well, just to teach the community on that and uh, a green building audit. And uh, we got a couple more workshops as well. Um, but other than that, I hope you guys enjoyed my slide. I was kind of rough at the uh, at the beginning there, I was a little nervous, I'm not gonna lie, but uh, I, got, I got used to it over time, but I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Durdana Islam. Thank you, Wakpa. You have <laughs> done an amazing presentation. Let's give Thank him you. a big hand. That was amazing. And I've learned so much from your presentation. Uh, as Wakpa has introduced me, my name is Dr. Durdana Islam and I am the program manager of Manitoba's Climate Action Team. And you can see our logo on the top left corner on the screen. So what is Manitoba's Climate Action Team? I'm gonna take you a little bit back about the history of how we started. In 2019, Manitoba province has released their climate action plan and it was not consulted, like the experts did not consult with any the anybody in the community and it came out and five climate organizations, NGOs who work in the field of climate action came together and did a workshop by bringing community members, by bringing experts. And the thing that came out was what the province was proposing was not enough to meet the IPCC goal of reducing our of carbon emission by 50, uh, by zero, like zero person by 2050. So that's when these five organizations came together and collaborated to build the Manitoba's Climate Action Team. And these five organizations are Green Action Team is one of the organizations and you know Green Action Team is organizing this Arise uh, lunch program, uh, lunch and learn program. And I would like to thank Chantal and Amy, my amazing colleagues to do what they're doing to make us come walk by and me to come and present our work. So thank you, Chantal and Amy. And second organization that's part of it is Climate Change Connection, then Wilderness Committee, CCPA, that is Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives and Amy JC is Manitoba's Energy Justice Coalition. So these five organizations came together and applied for funding. We got a federal funding and also we got funding from Winnipeg Foundation to help us the work that we're doing. And that's how I was hired. So my goal is to manage the overall project. Since Wakpa talked about his role, I thought I'll take the chance to talk about my role um, as a program manager of Manitoba's Climate Action Day. And is, as you can see in the bottom, it says Manitoba's Road to Resilience. So in the first year of our project, we developed a document that is there in the website if you want to see. And we developed a work plan how Manitoba can be fossil fuel free by 2050. And we have said that we can leave fossil fuel free for our transportation, for our food, energy sector, and all those areas. So we have already given a roadmap so we can implement these things and we need help from all different levels. So can you imagine if five organizations come together and can set this up and we, we all work together what we can achieve? Uh, what, well, do you mind to move to the next slide, please? Thank you. 
So this is our team members. And too bad I wasn't there at that time. So I was joking that maybe I should just Photoshop and put my face there. So these are all executive directors and team leads of all the five organizations that we have. And thank you, Amy, for putting the website for Climate Action um, MB, Manitoba's Climate Action Team. So can we go to the next slide, please, Wakpa? Thanks. So this is kind of interesting because in the first phase, we have this photo to show that because Manitoba, like Climate Action Team, if you look at it, the abbreviation is CAT, C-A-T, right? So we just had that photo and that is the magazine that we published in the first year that you can see in our website as well that is Road to Resilience Manitoba and it's kind of funny ways that we're not sleeping on climate action so we're the one who believes in action and we can help other communities come up with their climate action strategies and how we can achieve there. Uh, next slide please Wafa. And uh, when WACPA is transitioning the slide, let me just tell you a little bit about what we are doing is that we will be working with Sioux Valley Dakota Nation. So I reached out to them and uh, Cheyenne and WACPA welcomed us really warmly with warm heart and very welcoming. So we went there and did a half day workshop. We sat down with the community members, we asked, what are the things that you would need help with? Because the way Manitoba's climate action team works is that we take input from the community. We simply don't go and say that, hey, this is what needs to be done because the community members are the best expert of what needs to be done. And based on that, uh, with Sioux Valley Dakota Nation, we are going to arrange 10 workshops that WACPA has said, and I will be taking help from our colleagues from the Green Action Center, Chantal and Amy will also be a part of that, where we're gonna go uh, to Sioux Valley Dakota Nation whenever WACPA and Cheyenne tells us they're available for us to go there. And we will be delivering those 10 workshops and bike repair workshop, varmint composting are a couple of uh, two among 10 of them. So based on the need, we will be working to help the community. And at this point, I would like to show you a video that Manitoba's Climate Action Team did to get put together. And this is the goal that we want to achieve. So if you look at the video and if you think that you would like to work with me in the last slide, uh, WACPA has put my email address and my contact and WACPAs, that would be really good. Uh, so it's gonna be four minutes and I have another meeting at once. So I'll have to run two minutes ahead of time, say hi that. Uh, so I can join. So I really appreciate everybody coming and being here in our presentation. And as I know uh, that many of us are coming from many different communities, from rural communities, from indigenous communities, because Climate Action Team will be working with 10 communities, five communities are indigenous communities, and five will be settlers communities. So if you or your community is interested to work with us, please send us an email. My email is durdana at the rate of climateactionmb.ca and WACPA will show you in the last slide as well. And thank you, let's watch the video, thanks. We can't hear it, WACPA. Okay, um, the volume. try to turn it up. Could you guys hear it now? No. Um, maybe could people just read the subtitles at the bottom? Because I could hear it on my end. Uh, do you want to try again? If not, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, you have to send it, share it as a sound share as well. Oh, okay. I didn't know that sound no, share. That's yeah. okay. Like whenever. Oh, sound share. You, okay. Yeah. Okay, if you I, close it and do it again, maybe that's gonna down. help. Can you guys hear it to now? Lessen the heart. Yeah. yeah. If you want to start from to the beginning, a... we can oh, yeah, hear it okay. now. Thanks. Cannot continue to rely on fossil fuels. The rate that we currently are. The climate crisis is progressing and we need to adapt to lessen the harms. To build a resilient Manitoba, we need to feed, shelter, and move ourselves without fossil fuels. 
What could that look like? Imagine a Manitoba where towns, cities, and neighborhoods are thriving. People who use wheelchairs are able to move around freely because accessibility is always prioritized. People walk, cycle, and move around in pleasant, quiet surroundings. People know each other and depend upon each other. All neighborhoods have the essentials nearby. There are green spaces everywhere and a thick, healthy tree canopy. Anything that isn't within walking distance can easily and conveniently be reached by shared or public transportation. Public transit is affordable for all, and buses run on a frequent schedule. Since people live close to where they work, there isn't much need for personal automobiles. The few vehicles that are on the road are electric. Buildings are efficient, and what little heating and cooling is required is provided with a variety of energy sources. Most buildings are interconnected on a shared district heating and cooling system. Entrepreneurs, small businesses, social enterprises and cooperatives form the backbone of a dynamic local economy. The system is diverse and self-reliant, built on stability and not on perpetual growth. It uses local materials, capital and labor to provide meaningful employment meet local needs, and promote local trade. Everyone has access to a livable wage. There are gardens everywhere. People either grow their own food or buy food from nearby producers. Producers grow food in a system that rejuvenates depleted soils, promotes health, and creates opportunities for meaningful work. There is no waste. We use less and have sustainable ways to deal with our garbage. Much of this transformation has been achieved by addressing harmful systems and prioritizing reconciliation with Cree, Anishinaabe, Dakota, Oji Cree, Métis, Dene, and Inu peoples. Our democracy is strong. People participate in neighborhood governance and they have opportunities for their voices to be heard. Sounds like a beautiful dream, doesn't it? Many governments have chosen to not publicly discuss the urgency and scale of work required to adequately address the climate crisis. It is up to the community to think at this level and to show the way. We know this is possible. Join us for a series of videos, graphics, and more as we imagine Manitoba's road to resilience. Let's make this vision a reality. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, okay, awesome, there we go. I'm gonna just switch over to the, the presentation slide. Started all at the beginning, my bad. Um, we'll move back to the end there. Yeah, Derdana had to leave there, um, but we'll wrap up our presentation. Yeah, and if you guys want, uh, here's our slide where you can contact us. Uh, Walker McKay, Climate Change Research Assistant. Uh, my phone number is there. So if you guys uh, have a pen and paper with you, mark it down. Same with uh, Dr. Dardana Islams. Um, hers is below her name as well with her email address. Um, but no, I'd like to thank everyone who attended uh, today's, uh, this, today's lunch and learn. I think it's, uh, we got to move on to questions though. I think the hour is almost up. Um, but yeah, no, thank you. Thank you all for, uh, for tuning in. Thank you, doctor. Yep. Thanks so much.
uh, to the both of you. Uh, yes, Regana had to leave, but uh, we did leave her email uh, where she could be contacted if people have questions. Uh, one more info about the Climate Action Team. All right. So there was a bunch of questions here. Um, let's start from the beginning. All right. So the gang, uh, okay, well, uh, some people were just saying hi, introducing themselves. Um, comments, questions. Uh, so Debbie Wall was wondering would, would be interested in what Dakota words are applicable to effects of climate change that we have not experienced before. I know. Oh, like kind of like what what you're talking about is the newer words, kind of like that they didn't say back. Like back in the day, you know, I I doubt they said climate change. <laughs> so that's a perfect example right there. Yeah, no, that's something that we kind of need to develop with this Dakota Dictionary, and this is something we could, you know, sit down with elders and knowledge keepers in our community to just to discuss. Okay, well what's a word that we can use for climate and what's a word that we could use for like change and, you know, kind of take those kind of steps to form those words in Dakota, if that kind of makes they sense. They have a concept like that already. Yeah, okay. Oh, uh, would you like to come say hi? Sure. Oh uh, yeah, hey guys, uh, my um, my supervisor, Cheyenne Ironman is here. Uh, Hello. Yeah. <laughs> um, um. Yeah, yeah, so I guess just to talk a little bit on some of the language. Um, so the, the reason why we're doing the, the dictionary is, well, I mean, it's a really good exercise. We kind of did some with um, uh, planting and harvesting. He mentioned that one. We did one with birds. So it's actually a really fun exercise, um, you know, getting together with elders, having uh, some tea and a meal together and running through, you know, pictures and you know, bouncing off stories and things like that. So as a youth, it was really good to be part of that whole experience. And that's what we hope to do through this is actually like bring the community together, be part of that whole process of documenting words that aren't used every day. Um, and so the words that aren't used every day are kind of what what's at risk of being um, forgotten or lost. Um, and then there are words, um, like our, our seasons, uh, you know, there's certain words in our language that are gonna be impacted by climate change. So if you think of like our, our word for spring, um, it's based on the mating call of a chickadee, the same sound, wait do, wait do is what we call spring. Um, and uh, the, the chickadee's mating sound goes, like it's a whistle, like I can't whistle with my mask on, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so it's a whistle and it's it's based off of that. And so if you think about how climate change is impacting the birds and their mating times and things like that, well, last summer or last year, I heard the, the chickadee doing its mating call really early. So um, that's changing things because the, the time we hear the, that mating call is when the spring ceremonies start. And so things like that would be shifted. And so it's it's important to capture that and document those kinds of things. And that's what we're hoping to do with this gathering. And you mentioned about the early return of birds. I remember hearing on the radio, uh, someone mentioned they saw a uh, goose. <laughs> and they were just laughing because the next day was this, this very cold storm. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. A couple of community members here have seen some geese, never mind. <laughs> They're all <laughs> just confused. They're like, that's um, it. We're going, we're going back. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Uh, some uh, comments from Giselle. I get excited about what your community is doing. Just listening to you walk, walk, walk talk. There are such exciting things going on. Fantastic. Net zero. Awesome. Catch that water in a bucket and use it to flush the toilet. <laughs> uh, are you noticing wildlife populations declining above and beyond their natural waxing and waning? Yeah, and actually geese are a really good example of that because there's a gas station, uh, our petro gas station actually, um, that's built near uh, wetland habitat. Um, and a lot of the birds that use that as nesting grounds are now in Sioux Valley. And so we see a lot more geese here, even though it's not too far from there, but um, yeah, things like that. Uh, but there's also, like he mentioned, the deer, 
uh, the bears coming in closer, cougars that have been spotted. We've seen a moose uh, a couple months ago, um, and it was it was eating by the river nearby here. So um, it, it was really surprising to see that because I've never seen anything like that here in the area. Wow. Um, and someone mentioned uh, when you were talking about the BC heat waves that there was also over half a million farm animals that died in those heat waves. Um, do your community gardeners harvest their own seeds? Anina asked. So our gardeners um, try to reuse as much as they can. Um, but what what was really cool about having um, the gardens, so when they were first established in 2019, the community gardens, all of those seeds were purchased except for um, the traditional uh, corn that we have. So we call that pishtayapi. Um, and those seeds were given to us by an elder. And so those are what we've used again this year because we, we didn't gar have our community gardens in 2020. Um, they were kind of put on hold then. And then so they, they were um, started back up this year or 2021, I guess. All right, great. Uh, Debbie Wall commented, wow, I'd love to go on a trip like that. Probably referring to the kayaking trip. It looks awesome. Uh, nothing tastes better than something you've made yourself, probably referring to the canning workshop you did. Um, let's see. Uh, Nina asked, do you record the lessons to share with the community? As I did notice when you showed the presentation, uh, it looked like it was going live. Um, the face. Okay. We're on the thing, but thank you. Um, sorry, what was that? The, uh... the what record the lessons, lessons to share with the community um yeah a lot of our stuff can be found on facebook um on our facebook page which is svdn we pazoka wakfa climate change and environment it's a really long name but um <laughs> Maybe yeah put it in there. yeah uh okay. so yeah a lot of our stuff is left up there um and it's a it's, it's a public page um we go live um tuesdays and thursdays too uh, on our radio station and um, Thursdays we go live on Zoom and Facebook Live uh, and the radio, all three platforms at once. And we talk about things that, you know, what we're up to um, and share information. So like our discussion topic, it's a discussion topic, new one each week. Um, and this week it's going to be on energy conservation. Awesome. Um, somebody mentioned red wigglers about the vermicomposting. Uh, they also mentioned a comment. Thank you for your presentation, all the great work you're doing. Kendra also said, amazing, thank you. Amy says, woohoo. <laughs> Nina says, great presentation. Stacy, awesome work and great presentation, she says. Ryan says, very interesting. Um, and there's the links for Climate Action Manitoba. Uh, they're down his email. Let's see. Um, so I let's see. Someone Debbie says thank you, Dr. D. Giselle says thank you so much for sharing. I love what you're doing. Keep it up. Could these slides and websites be given to my email address? Uh, we'll yeah share the. Yeah, we could share them. Hey, our our, our presentation slides. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we could share it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just send them to me and. Uh, We'll uh, get them uploaded. Okay. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed listening and learning. Jane says, Debbie says, hi, Cheyenne. Brian says, perhaps a typo. Uh, Dana, climate action in Manitoba.ca. Uh, uh, slower case. Okay. Um, I did have a question. Um, you mentioned community health fairs. How often are they done and what can people expect at these fairs? Are they just local community or is it open to the public? Community what? Are, are, are Watani sales, do you mean? Uh, you like our farmer's market type of thing that I was talking about? I think you call it a community health fair. Oh, a health fair? Like we, uh, we have a lot of different things we do. So like we have yeah. regular community engagements, which happen in person and virtually. But okay. um, I don't know if maybe that's what's... I think We've I done job fairs too, and uh, I think uh, we're. I think I maybe I might maybe you said it incorrectly, but no, I, I we we have a Watani sales. Oh, we're going to have Watani sales monthly uh, sales. You know, kind of like farmers markets. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, yeah you had mentioned you were giving uh, lettuce away to elders at these fairs. Oh, oh, with the community yeah. gardens, the out the yeah, the lettuce that we gave away to are like you know, oh, the, all the produce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so uh, they have regular elder gatherings just to um, consult with them on you know certain protocols or get direction from the elders when they're doing um, certain projects or or just, and it's just a good opportunity to have elders together and visit. Um, so there was one last summer, um, and that they, they happen pretty regularly, obviously not during COVID, but, uh, we were able to have one in the summer and that's when we actually had our first big harvest. So we took everything there and distributed it to the elders. Nice. And that kind of ties back to some of our, our traditional values, right? About, um, caring for our elders. They spent their lives raising us. Now it's our turn to return the favor and take care of them. And this is kind of our way of being able to do that. Great, so glad to hear. Um, I had another question. I saw how long your trip was. Um, did you sort of measure like how many kilometers in total that was? 60. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was, 60 um, it was, it was 60. around 66, yeah, 60. 66 it was around there though, for sure. <laughs> wow. All right. And you said you go live via Facebook Tuesday and Thursday, and your next topic will be energy efficiency. Oh, so we only go live on Facebook on Thursdays. Uh, oh, Thursday. So we're going to be going on, on live um, at four o'clock today. Um, oh. It's the radio station that we we go twice a day live. I mean, twice a day, twice a week. Twice, yeah. Okay, nice. All right, and I don't see any other questions. Uh, Amy, do you have any questions? If not, I will. <laughs> this is really cool. Nope, I'm good. I, yeah. <laughs> I'm excited to check out your uh, Facebook page to see the different videos and lives. I wanted to see the canning workshop. So, yeah, actually, we're hoping to cut those down because they were just done live, so everybody um, with a home kit could follow along. But hopefully, we can find some time to shorten those down. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you for having um, having what thought was in today. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a uh, his first one so yeah uh, my, yeah my first time taking the lead on a presentation like this so a little rusty but i'll get to it for <laughs> sure thank you thank you all right so all right, um, step out great thanks, thanks so much Diane. uh thank so you. our upcoming webinars um next week will be thursday march 17th from 12 to 1 and we'll be doing a hands-on mixed media workshop uh called garbage pets in your way and here to stay by eddie ayub from Art City. Uh, there is some supplies, supply kits that will be provided that are uh, will be available to pick up from our office. So please send us an email uh, if you're interested in getting in doing this virtually and picking up a supply kit. Um, the week after that, webinar number five, Thursday, March 24th, will be focused on climate change, indigenous knowledge, and adaptation within the prairies by Brett Poussin and Dr. Ian Moreau from the Club's Perry Climate Center. Looking forward to that. Webinar six, which will wrap up our series, will be hearing from Audrey Logan from Dehydration Nations, where she'll be talking about traditional food preservation and dehydration. So that will be interesting, which is a good tie in with the food security and gardening aspect and the canning. Um, so if you, in any event you missed the webinar, check out our YouTube channel where all webinars will be uploaded and available to watch at any time. Uh, we'll have them uploaded uh, within two business days at the most. Uh, and if you want to reach out to us, our email is fnwm at greenactioncenter.ca, or you can follow us on Facebook, uh, fnwmp, uh, or our Instagram. And if you're interested in signing up for our e-newsletter uh, to stay in touch, which will be presented uh, by month, every two months, uh, feel free to join our newsletter as well. So I would like to thank our presenters, uh, Wafa Fikay and Dr. 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 Dano Islam from the Green Action Center. And, uh, and do you have any closing remarks? 
No, I'd just like to thank everyone for, uh, for sitting through the presentation and listening in as to what we have to share with our program. Please follow our Facebook page. Uh, you know, just check out some of our previous videos and, you know, some of our posts. And uh, we post like basically every day on new objectives and new things that we're doing in the community. So please follow us on Facebook. And uh, thank you once again. And I hope everyone has a good, good afternoon and a good weekend. Stay safe. COVID's getting bad. Stay safe, please. <laughs> All righty. Thank you. All have right. a good day. Have a good day, much. everyone. Bye.